can you get an acrylic airbrush painting to look like a traditional oil painting? That's what this tutorial is all about, and we're going to pick up right from where we left off in last week's video. And this is the painting that we're copying, which is a self-portrait painted by Rembrandt in 1660. The original painting is located at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And if you want to learn some art history about Rembrandt, make sure to check out last week's video, which I'm linking down below. Last week we finished up here with the nose, so what I want to do is start with this right eye and get this in place. Now the whole right side of this face is basically in a cast shadow. The lighting is very dramatic here with the single light source coming from the upper left hand side. So this puts the right side of the portrait in shadow, but Rembrandt allowed some of that light to bounce off a wall. And that reflected light was diffused, so it adds just a bit of light into the shadow. This style of lighting is still incredibly popular up to this day. Even in modern day photography and cinematography, this is still called Rembrandt lighting. And in art history, this style of lighting is referred to as chiaroscuro, which was very, very popular during the Baroque period. Undoubtedly, this style came directly from the Italians, most notably Caravaggio, who had a huge influence on the Dutch artist in Utrecht. The influence is there for sure, but it's not as extreme as the tenembrism style that Caravaggio achieved in a lot of his paintings. So basically what I'm going to do here is get in the major features on the right side in, you know, parts of the eye, the shadow underneath the nose, and the curve that separates the portrait from the background. And once those are all in, then I'm just going to apply a transparent paint over the top, which is called a glaze of a darker, cooler tone, which is going to darken this whole area up. To get in this eye, I'm going around with my shield and adding in the major parts I see, those large transitions between the iris and the eyelids, and then also between the iris and the sclera, which are the whites of the eyes. And then I could paint in the areas inside those lines because those initial lines are not going to go anywhere. Remember, this paint is transparent. So if anything, as I spray this area in freehand, those original lines will just darken up more. I noticed that the right side of this iris was a little bit off, so I just came back in here with the shield, sprayed some more paint on, and adjusted it. Just remember when you add in your initial lines with the shield, you know, those transitions points, you're never stuck with them as long as you spray a light amount of paint. You could always erase it and adjust them. And just so you know, I'm still using the flesh tone that we mixed in last week's video. There's a few creases just above this upper eyelid, so I'm using a shield to lightly spray over the edge, get down that line. That's going to be the transition point between the shadow and the highlight of that curve. I'll use my shield to get in this other line just above that, which is going to be the edge of the eyebrow. And then I'll just go back to the airbrush freehand, slowly adding paint around this whole area to build up that darkness. Since I'm adding more and more paint to darken up the value, I want to make sure that I don't lose any detail. So this thin highlight here, I'm erasing out with my eraser now. This way, as I darken up around it, I'll still be able to see that, so I didn't lose my initial line drawing underneath. The same thing goes for this thin highlight along the lower eyelid. I'm erasing it in now. That way, I'm not going to lose it. For the rest of this area surrounding the eye, if you look at Rembrandt's painting, you'll notice that a lot of it is very soft. He didn't add that much detail into the shadows. There's still plenty of detail there for sure, but it's just not as much as the highlight sections on the left side of the portrait. So for the majority of this, I'm just looking at the reference of Rembrandt's painting and painting it in freehand. Of course, I'll use some shields here or there to separate some lines like this one on the right, which separates the portrait from the hair. But for the rest of this, freehand is going to work better because it's going to give that very soft blended look. And in oil painting, this is done by laying down the values first of your paint and then using a larger, softer brush to blend them smooth. But with an airbrush, we don't need to worry about blending because the airbrush does it automatically. So the airbrush is great at giving us soft lines and transitions, but the thing that it's not so good at is giving very sharp lines just because the paint is sprayed and atomized. So this is where shields and erasers come in. I'm using the eraser here to do two things. One is to brighten up an area. If I need a highlight, I can erase out the paint. But also, I'm trying to erase out in horizontal lines like I talked about in last week's video. To me, this almost looks like a paintbrush stroke. Now, in no way is it identical or perfect, but the goal of this whole video is to see if we can get an airbrush painting to not look like an airbrush painting, meaning to get away from that airbrushy look. And when I say airbrush look, I'm talking about that overly soft style that you naturally get when you just use an airbrush freehand. And I want to point out that there's nothing wrong with that airbrush look if that's what you're going for in your painting. But the point that I'm trying to make is that you're never limited to that style just because you choose to paint with an airbrush. 
Painting styles and techniques are always subjective. There's no right way to paint and there's no wrong way to paint. So with just a bit of erasing in that area, that airbrush look kind of fades away. It almost looks like there's some texture here and it was done with a tool that might not be an airbrush. And the other very important tool that really gives us those sharp lines is spraying paint over a shield. You could still get some pretty sharp lines using the airbrush freehand, but it'll never be as sharp as actually using a paintbrush. So this is why we use shields. The shield has a sharp edge, so when you spray over that, that sharp edge is transferred to the canvas, giving us a sharp line. So that's what I'm doing here for the outer contours of the lips. I want those sharp, and a shield works perfectly for that. Since a shield rarely fits the curve perfectly that you're trying to paint in, you'll see that I'll just move it around and spray over the area where I want paint to get a seamless transition between them. And if it doesn't come out perfect or seamless like this example here, it's not a problem because we could use an eraser if we want to clean it up or we can use the airbrush to paint over it. We could use a shield for that or we could just do it freehand to blend the area smooth. I'll get to that in a second, but what I want to do here is add in some of the facial hair where this mustache is. Now, it's very soft in the original painting, so I'm doing it freehand. And I can adjust the softness of this area by how much paint I apply, either by how far back I pull on the trigger or how far I am from the canvas. Now, let's go back to that lip and start cleaning up the edge. The shield worked great to give that sharp line, but it just seemed a bit too sharp for this painting. So if I spray over it freehand, some of that line still stays there, but it's just a little bit softer. To me, this just looks a little closer to the way that Rembrandt painted it in oils. Shields work great, I love them, I use them all the time, but if that was the only technique that I used, the final painting would take on this stenciled look. And that stencil look is almost the opposite of the traditional airbrush look. Everything is just too sharp. So I think painting is kind of a balancing act just between knowing when to have soft edges and when to have sharp ones. And that's exactly what I did here on the mouth. I mixed the two techniques, always looking at that reference, trying to copy it the best I can. So let's move along to this lower lip and I'll show you again how I use both techniques. Starting with my shield, I'm laying it right over my initial pencil drawing and then spraying paint toward the bottom of it. Now you could think of this line as the outline of the lower lip, but in nature, there's no outlines. Everything has a smooth transition from one value to another. So the way that I like to think of these lines is more as transition points. What this line is basically doing is separating that transition between the shadow underneath the lip to the highlight on the lower lip. So with that in mind, I wanna make sure that in that highlight area on the lower lip itself, I don't wanna to spray too much paint and in the shadow area, underneath the lip where it's going to be darker, I'm going to spray more paint. And I'll just do this freehand because the majority of this area underneath is pretty smooth. There's no sharp lines. The only really sharper line that I'm seeing is that transition point on the lower lip. And since we already painted that in, we could just do the rest freehand. So now on that lower lip itself, I see a highlight that Rembrandt painted in. So I'm going over to my eraser and trying to scratch it out again in kind of horizontal lines to make it look like a brush stroke. And while I have the eraser in my hand, I'm just gonna go around the surrounding area. If I see anything that just looks too smooth or too dark, I could erase out some texture in it to fix it. Moving along to the chin, I'm gonna speed through some of this because I think this is pretty straightforward. It's very similar to the area underneath the eye. What I mean by that is that it's very smooth, so I'm just gonna use some shields to define the outer parts, like the area underneath the chin and over to the right, and then I'm gonna paint in those macro values, the darker shadows on the right, and and the highlights on the left all done freehand and to break up some of that smoothness i'm going over to a skin texture template lightly spraying over it just to add some random dots in this area at this point i switched over to that second flesh tone color it's basically the same one with a lot of sepia in it this way it's a little bit darker and it's cooler and i'm spraying this right over that initial flesh tone color and you can see here how it works it just darkens everything up and the shadows just take on a more natural look. If I only use that initial flesh tone color for all the shadows, they would just be too warm. They'd look too orange, almost like a reddish look to them, and we don't want that. We want the shadows to be cooler. And this color works great, but of course you have other options too. You could just use sepia right from the bottle, lightly spray it over it, that'll work. And another option is to lightly spray a thin coating of black over the top. That's a little bit more risky, and I'm aware that a lot of painters absolutely hate to use black on any sort of portrait. I think you can get away with it as long as you use a 
small amount to shift the color temperature. And by risky, I just mean that it gets dark very quickly, so you want to go slow with it. But we'll talk about that in a future video. The last part we need to paint in here is the right side of the face. So the first thing I want to do is use this large shield and place it on my initial line drawing and spray to the right where the hair is. This way we're leaving the left side of this line, which is the portrait itself, completely blank. And now since I'm using a transparent paint, I'm not going to have to worry about masking this off again. So now I could just paint in the blank part of this portrait freehand without being concerned about anything to the right of it. Because if you look at Rembrandt's painting, you'll notice that to the right of it, it's just a very dark value. It's the hat and some area of the hair. So if any overspray from this paint gets on there, it's not a problem because it's just gonna darken it up, which is what we're gonna have to do anyway. So going back to that original flesh tone mixture, you could see I'm just spraying it over this area and that line to the right stays. We're not gonna lose it because there's no opacity within this paint. Remember that an opaque color is always gonna cover what's underneath it. So if that area is darker, it's gonna lighten it up. But if you're using a transparent color like what I'm doing here, that can only darken areas, never lighten them. So this works out well. I'm just spraying this area pretty flat because it doesn't have much detail. Rembrandt left this a lot softer than the highlighted areas, which have a bit more texture to them. And from here, I'm gonna switch back over to that second color, which has the sepia in it. And this way, we're gonna do just like what we did to the chin, and it's gonna darken it and cool this area up. And as you can see here, that second color just does a great job at cooling this area. And when I say cooler, I just mean less orange, less red and also darkening it up. And at this point, I think I got across everything that I wanted to in this painting tutorial. So that's where I'm gonna wrap this one up. I will be adding a few more videos on this painting on the members page if anyone's interested in learning some more techniques. Things like the forehead, the hat, the hair, and the fabric. And this is what the final painting looks like. By no means does it look exactly like an oil painting. But I hope that this video helps to show that an airbrush is just another painting tool and you could use it any way you'd like. So thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next week.